Hiya, everybody. Hey, you've had a really nice uh, day and that you had fun last night. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about mindfulness, what it is. And I'm going to do a bit and have a go at mindfulness because you all deserve a relax. So I suppose you've learned a lot about mental health, a lot about the stigma, about what a society can do about it. Um, but I'm going to teach you something that we can do about it as an individual. I'm a bit nervous no. as well. <laughs> so my research interests are preventative. You know, what can we do to empower people to really celebrate, to celebrate themselves, to have our self-love, to engage in strategies and things like that so we don't end up going on a downward trajectory into negative mental health? What can we do to increase positive mental health and remain in these states of well-being where we feel blissful, where we can handle things, where we've got buffers to stressors and real negative emotional reactivity. So um, mindfulness is a bit in the now at the minute, it's a bit popular isn't it? And it's because of this guy called John kabat -Zinn. And he grew up as a Jew, but he really got into Buddhism, he loved Buddhism, um, and he was a research he's a researcher and a bit like me, I'm very spiritual, very new age. I'm a bit of a hippie. Um, and a lot of people don't take that seriously. It's not accessible. So what I thought, like John kabat in is, well, if I can make it scientifically proven and say that at the beginning, everyone will take it seriously then. And it's really accessible. So I want to take all the fluff off, all of this, all this stigma that we were talking about before. I'll take the stigma off, this fluffy thing, and come life and meditation, a bit like John kabat in. So his research, basically took um, one element of mindfulness and meditation, which is the beginning bit of um, Buddhist practice. So mindfulness is a way of being able to train the mind so that we can then move into doing meditation, which is difficult if you can't control your mind, you can't focus, you can't visualize, you can't stay still with it. So mindfulness was the beginning bit, and he's took that and made it secular, and they've done loads of studies on it, and it really is really beneficial for people who are experiencing negative mental health for people who have a lot of chronic pain um, and for people who are struggling with addiction as well. Um, and because it's really popularised and there's loads of science, science behind it now, we see that in academic environments, they're loving it. There's a lot of research in Bangor and in Oxford. Um, and there's this .B curriculum, which is where they're rolling out a mindfulness curriculum in schools. And it's having a really be beneficial impact on, on children in schools. It's helping them cope with the stress of exams, with the stress of being at school. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's really having some really beneficial effects. So, what is it? Basically, um, it's a life philosophy in itself and it's also the practice. So, John Kabat-Zinn de defined it as being a way of paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, non-judgmentally. So, that's the life philosophy. And there's also the practice. So, we can say that's that's mindfulness, the life philosophy is mindfulness, but then when you actually do the practice itself, we should really call that mindlessness. So what we're trying to do is be less about the mind and more about just keeping it still and not having thoughts, you know, just, just being still, almost like you're on an island with loads of busy stuff going around you all the time, and you're just still, not being attached to things. So then without the judgment, you don't get the emotion, do you? Um, and if you're paying attention, if you're focused, you're not ruminating, and thinking about things in the past and the future which can then start these emotions as well, which stresses out. Um, in the literature, we say it's a mental mode characterised by attention to present moment experience without conceptual elaboration or emotional reactivity. And the Buddhist definition is a mental state of being firmly fixed on a single object. So that's why we use it, to control our mind so that we can control our emotions. So shall we have a go? So the first thing we want to do is set our intention that we're going to just gift ourselves, not give ourselves, we're going to gift ourselves some time just to be still. And we want our body to be still so that our mind can be still as well. We want to give our, ch our mind as much chance as possible to really be able to be still. So we set our body, we set our posture. So we want to put our feet on the floor, make sure our legs are relaxed. You can sit with your hands in your lap, make sure they're relaxed. 
You want to stretch your neck a little bit as well. Roll your shoulders. Take a couple of deep breaths. And then on the next out breath, we'll just gently close our eyes. And we're settling into our body. So what we're going to do is really peer into that darkness that's there behind the eyes, where usually we have that mental TV screen. Just look into it. And we can bring our mind into our body more. And what's been going on, been busy thinking about things, engaged in things. Just want to bring the mind to a still place and peer into this darkness. Just settle the mind down and bring it into the body by moving the mind. Put it on the contact points where the feet are touching the floor. Really experience that pressure of the weight of the legs and the heels and then on the balls of the feet. And we can move our mind to our buttocks, squashed against the chair. That sensation of the weight of the torso sitting in the buttocks. And the contact points of the hands resting on the legs. Is the sensation greater in the leg, feeling the hand touching it, or is it greater in the hand touching the leg? Then we can move our mind to our back, resting against the back of the chair. And then to start the mindfulness practice, we move our mind onto the breath. Just experiencing that rhythm of the breath cycle. The rise of the in-breath, the fall of the out-breath, and then that pause in between where we really drop into stillness. It's like a fleeting moment of paralysis which feels quite pleasant. And the way of training the mind to be more focused is to just really be consumed by this experience of the breath cycle. So we're going to watch it, we're going to observe the breath cycle. We're going to compare each breath to the one that came before very inquisitive. So it's almost like we become the breath. You can ask yourself, which part do I like best? Do I prefer the in-breath? Experience filling up. Or I prefer the out-breath experience of releasing, letting go. Or do I prefer the pause in between, that stillness, that pleasant paralysis, where we're not doing anything. We can marvel a little bit at the breath, this simple thing which goes on without any need of our tension, keeps us alive. And the way that we train the mind is by counting these breath cycles or being consumed by the experience of it. And our mind is very busy. It likes to think about things 